structure of the neuron. Now let's move on to the classification of nerve fibers. There are six classifications. First is depending upon the structure, second upon distribution, third upon origin, function, secretion of neurotransmitter and depending upon the diameter and conduction of impulse. So these are the six classifications. Let's learn one by one in detail. First is depending upon the structure of the nerve fiber, we have myelinated and non-myelinated nerve fiber. The myelinated nerve fiber is covered by myelin sheath. The non-myelinated nerve fibers are not covered by myelin sheath. The second classification is depending upon the distribution of the nerve fibers. We have the somatic nerve fibers, the visceral or autonomic nerve fibers. Now, the somatic nerve fibers supply the skeletal muscles of the body, whereas the visceral or autonomic nerve fibers supply the internal organs of our body. The third classification is depending upon the origin of the nerve fibers. According to that, we have the cranial nerve fibers and the spinal nerve fibers. The cranial nerve fibers arise from the brain while the spinal nerve fibers arise from the spinal cord. Fourth is depending upon the function. Depending, depending upon function, we have sensory nerve fibers, motor nerve fibers. This one is easy. Sensory nerve fibers carry impulses from different parts of the body to the CNS, as I had explained earlier in the classification of new nerve cells. We had uh, classified it as uh, sensory and motor. Similarly, here also sensory nerve fibers carry stimulate impulses from different parts of the body to the CNS. Motor nerve fibers carry motor impulses from the CNS to different parts of the body. And the fifth classification is depending upon the secretion of neurotransmitters. We have adrenergic nerve fibers and cholinergic nerve fibers. Adrenergic nerve fibers secrete noradrenaline and cholinergic nerve fibers secrete acetylcholine. Now the last classification that is the sixth classification of nerve fibers is depending upon the diameter and conduction of impulse. Now this classification has a name and it is called the Erlanger-Gasser classification. Now on the basis of diameter of nerve fibers that is if, this, if we have a cross section this is the diameter of the nerve fibers. On the basis of diameter of fibers and the velocity of impulses that is the speed with which the impulses are carried. They are classified into three types, type A nerve fibers, type B nerve fibers and type C nerve fibers. Type A nerve fibers are the thickest fibers, they are myelinated. Type B nerve fibers are also myelinated. Type C fibers are the thinnest which is also known as type 4 nerve fibers. Now the type A nerve fibers which is the myelinated nerve fibers have certain subdivisions. They are subdivided into four types. First is type A alpha or type 1. Second is type A beta or type 2. Third is type A gamma nerve fibers. And uh, fourth is type A delta or type 3 nerve fibers. Now we have completed the classification of nerve fibers, the six classifications. Now moving on to the properties of nerve fibers. We have seven properties. First is excitability, conductivity, refractory period, summation, adaption, infatigability and all or none law. Now let's look at these properties in detail. The first property is excitability. Excitability is defined as the physiochemical change that occurs in a tissue when stimulus is applied. For example, for example, this is a tissue and if a stimulus is applied, there occurs a physico -chem physiochemical change in it which is known as the excitability. Now, nerve fibers have a low threshold for excitation than other cells. That is, they need a very less stimulus to, to produce some change. Now, let us look at two terms in excitability that is response to stimulus and voltage clamping. First, response to stimulus. When a nerve fiber is stimulated, two types of responses develop based on the strength of the stimulus. First is action potential and second is electronic potential or local potential. Next is the voltage clamping. It refers to an experimental method, voltage clamping. It is an experimental method that uses electrodes 
to alter and control the membrane potential of a nerve cell. It is used to measure the ionic current across the membrane of the nerve cell. It is used to uh, measure the ionic current that is uh, available across the membrane of the nerve cell. So, it is an experimental method. Now, let us move on to the second property of nerve fibers that is conductivity. Conductivity is the ability of nerve fibers to transmit impulses from one area of the stimulation to the other areas. In conductivity, let us look at two points. First is mechanism of conduction of action potential, then conduction through myelinated nerve fibers which is known as saltatory conduction. I have mentioned about saltatory conduction earlier. Now, the mechanism of conduction of action potential. Depolarization occurs first at the site of transmission in nerve fibers. For example, if an impulse is put on a nerve fiber at one end, depolarization occurs there. Once it travels throughout the entire nerve, it is followed by repolarization. Next is conduction through myelinated nerve fibers that is solitary conduction. We already know that solitary conduction is a form of conduction of nerve impulse in which the impulse jumps from one node of Ranvier to the other just as I had explained earlier. Now, let us move on to the third property of nerve fibers that is refractory period. Now, this refractory period is the period in which the nerve does not give any response to a stimulus. Now, this refractory period is of two types, absolute refractory period and relative refractory period. Let us look at absolute refractory period. It is a period during which the nerve does not show any response at all whatever may, may be the strength of the stimulus. For example, if a stimulus is applied, the nerve fiber will not show any response no matter what strength of stimulus is put. That is called absolute refractory period. Now, second is relative refractory period. It is a period during which the nerve fiber shows response if the strength of the stimulus is increased to maximum. For example, if it is try increase, the stimulus is increased to maximum on the nerve fiber, it will show some uh, response that is known as relative refractory period. Now, the next property of nerve fiber is summation. When one subliminal stimulus is applied, it does not produce any response in the nerve fiber because the subliminal stimulus is very weak. Now, what is subliminal stimulus? For example, if something is shown for you for less than one second, you cannot grasp it or the stimulus is very weak. Now, that kind of stimulus is known as subliminal stimulus. So, when one subliminal stimulus is applied, it does not produce any response in the nerve fiber because it is very weak. However, if two or more subliminal stimulus is applied with a short interval of about 0.5 milliseconds, the response is produced. This phenomenon is called summation. Now, the next property of nerve fiber is adaptation. The slow decrease in excitability on stimulating the nerve fiber continuously and complete cessation or stopping of it to show any response later is termed as adaptation or accommodation. Now, what does this mean? For example, if you go to the gym for the first day, when you take small weights, it might be heavy or you might find it a little painful for your muscles the next day. But after a few days, you will slowly start to take more weights because the body or the muscles get adapted to the first stimuli that is of smaller weights and slowly, slowly you will be able to take more weights. So that entire process, what that happens in the nerve fibers is termed as adaptation or accommodation. Now the next property is infatigability. Nerve fiber cannot be fatigued even if it is stimulated continuously for a long time. That is known as infatigability. Now, the last property of nerve fiber is all or none law. According to this, it states that when a nerve is stimulated by a stimulus, it gives maximum response or no response at all. Now, we have covered the properties of nerve fibers. Next, we are looking at the degeneration and regeneration of nerve fibers. Now, degenerative changes are the various changes that occur in the nerve fiber and nerve cell body when a nerve fiber is injured. Now, let us look at the causes for injury of the nerve fiber. First is obstruction of blood flow. Second, local injection, injection of a toxic substance. Third is crushing of a nerve fiber and fourth is transection of a nerve fiber. Now, let us look at the degrees of injury of nerve fibers. 
Now, Sunderland classified injury of nerve fibers into five categories depending upon the order of severity. Now, this is an important thing that we have to learn that is degree of injury of nerve fibers. Now, let us look at the first one that is first degree injury. It is the most common type of injury to the nerves. It is caused by applying pressure over a nerve for a short period leading to occlusion of blood flow and hypoxia. Now, in this type of injury, the axon, we know the structure of the neuron, right? In this type of injury, the axon is not destroyed. But mild demyelination occurs, which is the myelin sheath is demyelinated. The axon loses the function temporarily for a short time, which is called the conduction block. The function returns within a few hours to a few weeks. And this first degree injury is known as Seddon's neuropraxia. Now, let us look at the second degree nerve injury. It occurs due to prolonged and severe pressure which causes Wallerian degeneration. The endoneurium is intact and the repair and reconstruction takes 18 months. And this type of injury that is the second degree injury is known as axonotmesis. Now, let us look at third degree nerve injury. The endoneurium is interrupted. The epineurium and perineurium are intact. After degeneration, the recovery is slow and poor. And the third, fourth and fifth degrees of injuries are called neurotomesis. Now, the fourth degree injury, it is more severe. The epineurium, perineurium are also interrupted and regeneration is poor or incomplete. While finally, we have the fifth degree of injury, which is the complete transection of the nerve trunk with loss of continuity. We have completed the degrees of injury. Now, let us look at the degenerative changes in the neuron. We have three types of degenerative changes. First is Wallerian degeneration. Second is retrograde de degeneration. And third is transneuronal degeneration. First, let us look at Wallerian degeneration. It is a pathological changes that occurs in the distal cut end of the nerve fiber that is the axon. It is also called orthograde degeneration that is the Wallerian degeneration is also called orthograde degeneration. Now, what are the changes that occur in the nerve in Wallerian degeneration? First is the axis cylinder swells and breaks up into small pieces. The myelin sheet that is the covering is slowly disintegrated into fat droplets. And third change is that the neurilemmal sheath is unaffected, but the Schwann cells multiply rapidly. These are the three changes that occur in Wallerian degeneration. Now, the second type is the retrograde degeneration. These are the pathological changes that occurs in the nerve cell body and the axon that is proximal to the cut end. Now, what are the changes that occur in the nerve cell body? There is the nissel granules that we learned, they disintegrate, the Golgi apparatus also disintegrates and the nerve cell body swells. In the Wallerian degeneration, it was the axis cylinder that swells, but here in the retrograde degeneration, it is the nerve cell body that swells. The third type of degeneration is the transneuronal degeneration. Now, if an efferent nerve fiber is cut, we already know what is an efferent nerve fiber, that is a sensory nerve fiber that carry impulses from the peripheral organs to the central nervous system. So, if an efferent nerve fiber is cut, the degenerative changes occur in the neuron with which the efferent nerve fiber synapses. If two nerve fibers are there, they are synapse in the place where it means it's called the synapse. So, the, in, if an efferent nerve fiber is cut, the degenerative ch changes occur in the neuron with which the nerve fiber synapses. So, examples are chromatolysis in the cells of lateral geniculate body and second is degeneration of cells in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. These are the two examples. Now, we have learned about the degeneration of nerve fibers. Finally, let us look at regeneration of nerve fibers. The term regeneration refers to regrowth of lost or destroyed part of the tissue. Now, let us look at the stages of regeneration. We have 10 points. First is pseudopodia like extensions grow from the proximal cut end of the nerve. For example, this is the proximal cut end of the nerve. Pseudopodia like extensions grow from the proximal cut end of the nerves and this is called fibrils or regenerative sprouts. 
Second point is that the fibrils move towards the distal cut end. Now the third point is that some of the fibrils enter the neurilemmal tube of the distal end and forms the axis cylinder. Now the fourth point is that the Schwann cells line up the neurilemmal tube and guides the fibrils into the tube. Now the fifth point is that the axis cylinder is fully established inside the neurilemmal tube. The sixth point is that myelin sheath is formed by the Schwann cells. Myelination is completed within one year. The seventh point is that the diameter of the nerve fiber gradually increases. Now after the diameter of the nerve fiber increases, in the nerve cell body, the first the nissle granules appear followed by the Golgi apparatus. That is the first the nissle granules appear followed by the Golgi apparatus. That is the eighth point. And finally, the ninth point is that the cell loses the excess fluid. And finally, tenth point is that though anatomical regeneration occurs in the nerve, the functional recovery occurs only after a long period. So this was all about neuron and nerve fibers. I hope you found this video helpful. Thank you so much for watching.